Thank you so much, Drew, for joining me. Really appreciate it. I'm super excited to talk about your amazing new book. Uh, which is there and um, you know I'm just going to do a quick uh, introduction and go straight into it. So Drew Povey is an influential leadership authority with a unique multi-sector viewpoint on creating innovative and sustainable change. He has over 20 years experience working in elite level sport and education. The last decade he has also been privileged enough to work with charitable organizations, SMEs, multinational businesses, the NHS, and with the police. And this book, written with Sam Draper, When the Clouds Come, is a secret weapon to dealing with obstacles and challenges in sport, work, education, and life in general. So thank you, Drew. Really appreciate it. Really excited to talk about your book. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. And thanks for that very kind, potentially overly generous introduction. (laughs) but it's much appreciated no no I appreciate it because first of all I have to ask is like how did you come up with the term when the clouds come well yeah um so it was I wanted to do a book on on this kind of topic because I think that it's really useful to hear about people's successes and I think you know you go on Instagram and you're looking at everybody's successes and the best life stuff that people talk about but I wanted to write something and produce something and throw it into the world that would help people join the difficult times because we all have them, Mm -hmm. whether that's at work, whether that's at home, personally and professionally, it's going to happen. So I've kind of had this want to put something out there that would do exactly that. And I was having a run actually in Wales. Uh, We've got a caravan in Wales and I was running along uh, the seafront. It's an, it's an amazing view. And as I'm running along there, it's a really hot day and um, I'm, I'm running and I'm starting to overheat a little bit. And then just at that moment, there's a nice gust of wind and a cloud just comes in the way. And I'm thinking, well, thank goodness for that, as you do when you're kind of hot. And then as I was running along, I was thinking, that's great that that cloud's there. But then I could see the beach and people were on the beach. And I was thinking they've probably got the opposite view of like, you know, that cloud coming. They're probably going, get out the way. I want to get some rays and get some vitamin D in, in, in the old system. So the whole idea with it was, well, that's the same cloud, same sun, but very different outcomes. And I think in life, the clouds are going to come as we talk about at the beginning of the book. So it seemed to fit for me, you know, clouds come for, a, you know, different reasons. They can be a good thing disguised as a bad thing. They can sometimes last for a while in the great British winters that we have. And even in the summer, it seems uh, we're we're experiencing some of that now. But of course, they can come and pass quite quickly. So it seemed to me to be a a useful way of looking at life's difficulties as well. You know, and sometimes it's a it's a serious thunderstorm of clouds. Mm -hmm. And then other times it, it can be, you know, just a bit of cloud to give you a bit of shelter. So some are less impactful than others. So it seemed to work in my head, at least. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. Because the thing is, we have so many sort of metaphors, isn't it, with uh, clouds and things like it's silver linings and all of that. So it made complete sense in terms of using it in this way. But it was such a greatly structured book, which was, I think, really helpful for in terms of especially after the pandemic to have an actual guide um, to sort of work with because obviously lots of people talk about some of these concepts but not so structured so I have to ask how many books did you actually read for this because there were like so many references yeah I'm I'm just a leadership geek you know people go so what exactly are you because you've done all these various things you do this leadership stuff you've done the school stuff you've worked in sport what 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 do you do and I was like, well, I'm just a leadership geek. And I, I love reading about it. It kind of the bug bit me in my early 20s. And I've just started mm-hmm. reading ferociously. I'm actually dyslexic. So oh, wow. I, I was, it was all audio books. Um, a lot of people go, well, you know, how did you uh, end up writing books? And of course, the answer to that is ghost writers. Uh, not so ghost, uh, actually, because I put, always believe in putting, you know, credit where credit's due and Mm -hmm. putting people on the cover and Sam was just brilliant to work with you know he was just fabulous and the structure of the book was really important actually because when we did the book yes we wanted it to be something people read because that's the point of doing a book but I wanted it to also be as well as that a kind of a reference guide so that when you've read the book like most things you've got to rinse and repeat to make sure that those things marinate and they stick and yeah. you use them in life and very often we'll read a book and then we'll never touch it again mm-hmm. i wanted to be one of those books that we kind of put on the shelf um and that 
in those moments when the clouds come, you can pick the book yeah. up and use it as a bit of a survival reference guide was the, was the idea behind it. And that's why we did the contents page in the way that we did. Mm -hmm. And we did the top 10 tips at the end in the way that we did. So it would be as sticky as possible. But also, if you're having a moment in life, which we all have, and that's the, the other bit I wanted to do the book, all, we all have these really difficult times. Well, they could just pick up the book, go to the contents page and find exactly the bit they're looking mm. for rather than a whole chapter on a topic actually breaking down to page numbers, the various bits within the topic. So it will be as useful and as used as possible by people. Yeah, that's bravo to you, because I, I think that's brilliant. You know, you know, you saw that you want to do this and you still found a way to do it, even with like ghostwriting and stuff. And I think that's brilliant because you're like representing, especially for the our, our dyslexic um, community, which is fantastic. So, yeah, well and done. I think I think sometimes, you know, there's a bit in the TV series uh, that we did about this, but you know, sometimes dyslexia can be seen as this huge difficulty and barrier and negative. And of course it brings issues with it. But, you know, I really do believe for me, it's been one of the greatest gifts I've been given because my mind works slightly differently and the yeah. creativity to produce leadership models or, or work with a team and spot cultural successes or failures or difficulties or challenges or however you want to frame it that's how my mind works so I think too often we can go oh well it doesn't fit for mm. that you know and the fact this is the third book that I've done is you know we shouldn't let things stand in the way and we we should always continue if we think something's important enough and as Simon Sinek says that why is strong enough for us we should push on and and do things and too often we get hung up on those barriers in life you know when the clouds do come yeah you know we can go oh well maybe not me then today and you know I'm not great at anything you know I'm really not I just work very hard and mm -hmm. you know won't take no for an answer I suppose and is willing to keep working on something until you get it to where you want to get it to yeah, no, that's awesome. Because actually, it just makes so much sense when you read the book, because obviously, you're, you're using all these tips, essentially, uh, that you've written about, isn't it? But some of it's so difficult, because it's like, why do you think it's so difficult to be resilient and courageous? Yeah, I mean, they're two huge topics. I mean, if you just take resilience, I think the the issue I've found over the years have been fascinated by this topic. You know, why do some people just go, come on, you know, mm -hmm. the stick up a lip stuff, let's go, let's go. And other people just sit there going, where's the white flag? Mm -hmm. I can't even find the white flag to wave the damn thing. It's, you know, you can't. And I, and, but then the more I looked at it, the more I read about it, the more I understood it. Because, again, when we did the book, I didn't want it to just be conceptual and theoretical. Mm -hmm. Everything I talk about and do it has to work in real life I have to have seen it work otherwise you can't put it out there because it's just going to be an idea that might or might not I want to yeah. give stuff out that is and the resilience stuff for me I kept reading stuff you know you hear the quotes like bounce back ability or mm -hmm. pull yourself up by your bootstraps or the step up a lip I mentioned a moment ago and that for me wasn't what resilience is because well, we talk about this in the book, you know, and I think we talk about lampposts, but I use a brick wall as an example today. You know, if if I run into a brick wall and get knocked down hmm. and I go, oh, I'm resilient, I'm going to get back up and I'm going to run into that brick wall again and I get knocked down, but I'm going to get up and run into the brick wall. That's not resilience for me. That is stupidity because I'm running into the same brick wall. Mm -hmm. So the bit for me was when I run into that brick wall and I, I'm on the ground, you've got to do the learning. You've got to do the reflection. You've got to get perspective on what's happening. So rather than it just being about let's get back to our feet quickly and come on, let's go again, actually, let's learn. And when we get back to our feet, let's get back smarter. So that bit was a was a was a crucial thing of just a, a probably a different play on it. Um, and some people might be listening to this going, duh, obvious, <laughs> kind of like, well, you weren't up all night coming up with that brain buster. But for me, I thought it was an important thing that I noticed people didn't grab hold of that learning element and mm -hmm. unlearning some stuff and relearning other stuff where to get back to your feet. And it's very similar with the courage thing. You know, people talk about courageous acts in life and let's have courageous leadership and 
I'm one of these people that goes a bit like I did with resilience, but what the hell is it? Mm. You know, what do I just feel great one day? And that was that bit about, yes, you've got to have that bit where you have got to take the leap of faith that people talk about, but then you've got to be able to keep it going as well, yeah. because, you know, a couple of days later when the, when the excitement and the, the sexiness of the idea that seems so great when you're in the yeah. pub on the Friday night, whether it's running a marathon or something, when you're doing the miles on the road a couple of weeks down the line and it's raining and the clouds have come and they're staying for a long time, it's that bit that we've got to understand is a major factor of courage as well. And just, I think, helping people frame these concepts and making them a bit more relatable and understandable and then touchable and then usable, mm. those things for me matter. And by talking about it i think it can help people to be courageous or to understand resilience and in those moments hopefully people will pick the book up and use it as that survival guide that we talk about yeah no for sure i love the references in it because all of them i was just like yeah like victor frankl's uh, book obviously obviously man search for meaning yes. and just even just on the sort of the general like um like anecdotes that I just didn't know about, like Starbucks and things like that. And I found that really interesting because obviously it is a way to kind of relate to what's what's being said. And I wanted to ask, is it better to be Apple or a hedgehog? <laughs> well, that's a that, that, that's a great question. I mean, for, firstly, on those on those stories, I think other people's stories are, are really important. Now, they're really important because when we when we go through a difficult time, and I'm not a psychologist and I'm not a psychiatrist and I won't be and I don't pretend to be, but but what I do understand is that we can very often become quite introspective mm. and we can like look at ourselves and we can internalise everything. And whilst there's some elements to that that we will want to do, there's a lot of power in reading other people's stories. It kind of takes you out of yourself and it stops that you know, pity party you can have, invite for one, just for yourself. And it gets you out of that. And then when you start reading about other people, you go, do you know what? I'm not the only person who's been in a place like this. I'm not the only person that's had mm. this happen. And those stories themselves, I think, can give us a lot of energy. I think yeah. we can find them quite encouraging. And I think they can be quite enthusing for us in terms of there is a way out of this. You know, mm. when I've had through difficult times and I read about some of these, you know, people who you know take take tiger woods as an example yeah you know he was you know just do it like tiger you know and then suddenly his world falls apart due to addiction and poor choices and behaviors and i think it was 2013 14 he's the most hated athlete you know, one of the most hated athletes on the planet then he comes back 19 and wins the match 2019 yeah. wins the masters and he you know that kind of bottom dog top dog you know, zero to hero stuff. So I think those stories are, are really important. And is it better to be more Apple or be more Hedgehog? Yeah, I think it. I think it depends. You know what what is important to me to, and I say this to everybody I work with, and and, and it's in the book a number of times. It, it's different things for different people. You know, what works for one person is not going to work for another. And again, there's a danger in people going, I have the answer mm. for you and here it is and follow my five-step process. And it will help lots of people. So I'm not saying don't do it, but I don't think it'll help everybody. And when you've got a company like Apple and the way they went about their business, that that worked for them yeah. in their industry, in their landscape with the people that they had. Mm. And I think there's a, huge danger in people going well I'll just do what Apple yeah. did because it worked for them and that same blueprint is going to work for everyone because it won't because we're not Steve Jobs we're not Apple and we might not be dealing with the same kind of landscape and what I think worked for Lego when they went back to the brick and that's what they were known for and knowing your strengths and knowing what you stand for I mean there is you know probably an argument to say that Apple probably knew what they were hedgehog principle wise it wasn't mm. about just a computer it was about creating innovative products that are really intuitive that people can use and then they took that into other areas outside of the computer market and I think it's just working out what's right for you and right for your circumstances you know it, most things in life has to be about context it has mm -hmm. to be about the situation but it has to be about our characters as well you know and what what we feel is the most powerful impactor for us yeah, no, definitely. And and you mentioned about introspection, which is so true. Um, you know, we, we do fail sometimes to be very self-aware. Um, and so I wanted to ask you personally, what is uncertainty to you? 
Yeah, so this is something that I just I just had to read about mm. because that 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 whole idea of looking inside yourself at the beginning of the pandemic when that part of the book I was really interested in there were two words that kept coming up one was pandemic mm. someone was talking about that and we probably didn't know what it means but it means a global epidemic because I was interested in it the other word that kept coming up was uncertainty mm. and I looked into both the words but then I was really fascinated by the word uncertainty and and for me, it depends how it's framed. Hmm. Like most things in life, it depends on how we look at it. You know, if, if we both looking at the same object over this camera here, you're going to see one side of my hand hmm. and seeing the other side of my hand. Okay. They look actually completely different, same hand. And I think that for me is is what we do very often um, in life and maybe don't always look at the other perspectives of things. But in terms of uncertainty, you know, when you ask most people, what the word says so for your listeners now if i say the word uncertainty what's the first word that pops in the head mm. i found that 90 percent of people will say something negative mm. you know because they'll say something about oh, anxiety unknown distrust mistrust tension concern worry fear mm. and of course we will do that as humans because of something called negativity bow uh negativity bias comes from a guy called roy baumeister mm. And I think that that I was interested in because not just during the pandemic, the more I've read about this, it wasn't just about the pandemic. Life is uncertain. Mm. Like, you know, we don't even know what's going to happen in the next two minutes. And we're on this yeah. podcast. Anything could happen. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we live in an uncertain world. But if the first human response to that is negative, then we probably need to spend a bit of time thinking about that. Mm. And actually, is uncertainty such a negative? And there's a lot of research out there um, about uncertainty being worse for us than bad news. Hmm. I, I was quite freaked out by that, to be honest. I was going, no way. There's surely a chance. But actually, I suppose if you're waiting for the doctor's appointment and, you know, you'd rather know. I just hmm. want to know the answer. And that's that's a bit of that. So for me, it was about reframing it. But then also understanding that anything great we've ever achieved in our lives whether that was on a sports field, whether that was in, in life at work or exams that we're taking or whatever, anything we've done really well, or if we've created a great social media account, when we started that thing, it was completely uncertain. Hmm. So when we talk about in the book again, you know, uncertainty is where innovation lives. Yeah. Any great innovation had to come from a place of uncertainty because if it was certain we'd have probably done it ages ago or someone else would have done it. Mm. Whereas this is like, how do we frame it? So I understand the negative connotations. I do that. You do that. We all do that. Mm. But actually there's some great elements to uncertainty around innovation or learning and growing or mm. actually yeah. uncertain things are quite exciting too. So for me, it was about uncertainty is powerful. Yeah. It absolutely is powerful. But again, I think we've got a choice there. Hmm. is that uncertainty going to be powerful to the negative i'm going to worry fear and get anxious or could we reframe it and go uncertainty is powerful my goodness me what could i do hmm. at this moment what am i going to learn and grow through this and these can sound a bit cheesy and a bit like you know a utopia that we'll might never get to but i do think it's possible to do that and again if you read about other people's stories anyone that's done anything great riddled with uncertainty hmm. so i think by digging into that word and that term and what does it mean to us and what's the impact on us, I think we can get some quite cool stuff out of it and actually maybe start to flip our thinking a little and seeing what there is on the end of it that can be a real positive. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I, I liked the idea because you don't think of it that way, which is um, going on holiday is, I guess, uncertainty in itself, isn't it? As you yeah. mentioned. Yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, I didn't really think of that. But we seem to have a sort of, a, a sort of a different categorization for certain things even though it's exactly the same thing isn't it it is uh, it is the same thing and, and 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 we can't forget that we are always going to protect ourselves so that's one aspect so we'll always err towards the negative hmm. and we know that we know that about you know all the research in positive psychology we're probably more likely to err towards the negative and worry about what could happen and what that could mean well, if we can work it through, there can be qu some quite exciting things there. And and as, as human beings, we're not always thinking about our thinking. No. And that's where that introspection comes in. And I think that's quite important to do because 
if we go on automatic pilot and we're not aware of what we're thinking, mm -hmm. and that's why I think the mindfulness and meditation and yoga movement is getting so big because yeah. you're just taking a moment to go, what are my thoughts doing? You know, uh, w you and I are speaking on this podcast that uh, I speak quite quickly, irritatingly, <laughs> so I've been told on many occasions, but <laughs> we're probably speaking, I don't know, 150 words, maybe up to 200 words for me a minute. But we speak to ourselves internally way above 800 words mm -hmm. per minute. Some people saying 12 to 1500. But are we aware of what we're saying to ourselves? Because I think catching that set of cogs that are moving can actually make us go, why the hell am I saying that to myself? Yeah. Why the hell am I thinking that? And I think because we go on automatic pilot, because there's so much going on, we've got the ring ping ding of the mobile phone. Yep. That can sometimes mean we just don't, take time to go what am I really doing and that is yes as you said earlier it's the whole self-awareness bit mm -hmm. you know how self-aware am I and what am I actually saying to myself and you know we'll, we'll see this a lot on social media but you would never talk to a friend of yours the way that you talk to yourself you'd yeah. be so much kinder we're, we're just not very nice to ourselves and I think catching that and then questioning it and going is that even true what am I doing? You know, again, in the, in the book, we talk about 95% on average is different. Some people say 92, some people say 97. So I go on average about 95% of the things we worry about don't ever happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. But they will pervade our thoughts. We will ruminate on these things. And it's probably quite good to kick ourselves up the backside and go, what am I even on about to myself? Definitely. And actually, um, there was a, a really interesting example you sent, which was um, the Alistair Campbell uh, sort of in his book about how many times the word crises had come up um, in the newspaper on the sort of year one, year two, year three of um, Tony Blair's government. And I was just wondering, like, so how do you differentiate between a crisis and a difficulty? Yeah, so this that's a it's a brilliant question. I love his book Winners. I think it's chapter 14. Um that's how sad I am. I can even remember the chapter <laughs> on crisis. Um but it was brilliant because it's like what is a crisis? Hmm. You know, if you've got a difficulty, we often catastrophize that. We know this and go, "Oh my goodness, it's the end of the world." And we do that um probably because we make it very personal and then we mm -hmm. make it pervasive. And then we think it's everything and you know, it's going to last forever. And they're, they're three elements that can really get us stuck. But I think it's about going, look, at the end of the day, what is going to happen as a result of this? Hmm. Trying to put it, you know, a great friend of mine, Paul McGee, the sumo guy. The oh, short yeah. Guy, he's fabulous. And we're, we're, we're great mates. You know, we go out and our conversations are amazing <laughs> yeah i can imagine <laughs> probably for nobody else in the world but me and him when we cut when we when we hang out together but he's great you know and he, he will often talk about this on a scale of one to ten you know where is this from kind of twin towers to teddy bear's picnic you know spilt jam at the teddy bear's pit you've got to you've got to get some kind of perspective on it and i think that we we often don't do that very well no. and we can get tired and again we're probably not really thinking about it and putting it in perspective, too quickly we go, no, oh, it's the end of the world. And and people are quite happy to do that. You know, we live in a a world which is, you know, bombarded with sensational media. And and I, I have to say that a lot of the people I've met in the media over the years, having done the things that I've done, they get battered for this. Oh, you media people, you're on this. Yeah. I'm like, well, hold on a minute. Let's go back to the source of the problem. Because we buy it, yes. we consume it, mm -hmm. we're on social media for it. So this is what we want. And again, this links that negativity bias stuff. But like we're feeding the animal here. And uh, mm. there was an American um, uh, news channel set up, which was just on positive news oh, yeah. articles. And no one blooming watched it. And, yeah. they, and they wouldn't watch it because we want the doom and gloom. So we're the kind of instigators for that. So I think it's about finding the measure of something is how I'd answer that and go like really how much of a big deal of this because not everything we talk about is a crisis. And mm -hmm. even if that worst case scenario was to happen, we'd probably be all right. Yeah, for sure. And do you know, the, weird, the, the, the funny thing is, is that, you know, the beach ball example you gave of uh, Paul 
Yes. He, he actually showed this to me when he was teaching me to do public speaking. So, uh, th- you know, I was just like, yeah. That was a really good example of uh, seeing different perspectives. Um, it is, because you're looking at the same thing. And then we start to, like, get really entrenched ideas. And you see this in all sectors. You know, they get really full-on ideas and they're going, well, that's the way it is. And that, But you're looking at the same thing. And, you know, the beach ball analogy for the listeners is, you know, you've got, if I'm looking at it and, and you're the other side of it again on the camera, it's I'm seeing red, blue and green and you're seeing orange, white and yellow. Mm same thing but a different angle on it and I think it's it's cool to look at other people's angles Mm, you know I I like doing I find that quite refreshing I like meeting different people and and seeing different ideas and different ways people have framed it and too often we don't challenge our thinking and of course a lot of the social media and again I'm not having a pop at them because that's what brings us back to social media but the social media companies have you know um ways that it's set up the um, algorithms and and all Mm -hmm. of that good stuff that I don't even pretend to understand, but they will pump content to you that you're interested in. And then you almost get in an echo chamber and you go, well, this is the way life is. And everyone agrees with me. And and actually, no, we should step outside of that and go, what is really going on? And okay, well, if they've got a completely different view and you know, we can sometimes say that they're an idiot, so they won't get it. But actually, they're probably not an idiot. No. Let's just see what they're seeing that I'm missing. Yeah, hundred percent. It was a, yeah, it's so true. I'm like, and actually, I found all these models really helpful. So I've got to ask, like, so how did you come up with the different models? Like, so we've got courage, the three P's, and five H's. Yes. So that's just how my mind works. My little dyslexic mind. When I'm when I'm when I'm researching a topic and working on it so again these have all been field tested in sport business education nhs police i'm using them with leaders all the time and go have a play with this see what you think and we come back and we rehash it i suppose Mm -hmm. it's a bit like any kind of learning set that you you, you'd go and do and i find it fascinating but i always want to make something as sticky as possible as Mm -hmm. memorable as possible and that's just how my mind works it just starts to frame it up in some way and go this bit's first or no it's not this bit's first and then this bit links to it and what does that bit mean and then you know whether it's alliteration or um whatever the model looks like i try and get it so it makes sense Mm. but then people remember it because you know too many things are coming at us left right and center actually having something that says Right, this is a really easy framework that you could pop on your wall or you could just remind mm. yourself of or have up by your computer at work or you know, whatever people do with it, it's just gonna make it more memorable. And the more memorable I can make it, I think the more helpful it'll be to people. And that's obviously, as I said earlier, right at the start of the the podcast, that's that that's the ultimate goal for us. Mm, yeah, no, definitely. I think that was really helpful as well because it's true. Um the some of these um concepts can be quite abstract so you know having that kind of framework is really helpful awesome yeah no I I totally agree and you know that that level of understanding for yourself is we're we're sorely lacking unfortunately but you know we definitely should all try at least so huge thanks for writing this book and making us think about being self-aware and taking the next step because it is all about that isn't it it is it's 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 all about that and I just hope it helps people that's the whole idea behind it let's get it out let's get it into people's hands and hopefully when those clouds do come it can be that little thing that can make a big difference oh on that note oh thank you drew for coming that was so lovely uh really appreciate it and and so inspiring as well so thank you drew huge huge thanks my pleasure 